as you all are sitting down, we're going to give you a reaction to Professor Kuhn. Like, well, and then, like, later, years later, like, oh, I see. That's, oh, I get it. I get it now. <laughs> Professor Goldberg joins us from the University of Dayton. She's a visiting scholar for the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. And she was a clinical fellow and lecturer at Harvard Law School. And she graduated from Stanford Law School. Uh, she was a clerk for Judge Ronald Gilman on the Sixth Circuit, and she practiced appellate litigation at Lincoln Watkins. She previously served as a legal fellow at the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Professor Goldberg's scholarship focuses on the intersection of tort law remedies and First Amendment rights. She has been published in several law reviews, including the Columbia Law Review and the Michigan Law Review. Before she begins, um, please, uh, I think everyone has signed in the sign sheet. Please join me in welcoming her. Woo! Hello. Is this good? Can you hear the mic? All right. Uh, so thank you for coming. I'm going to be talking to you about coming to originalism, incorporating common law baselines into First Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, so mostly about the research I'm doing this semester at Georgetown as a fellow uh, or as a visiting scholar for the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Some of this is going to be autobiographical about my previous scholarship, the evolution of my scholarship, my methodological journey. Uh, and if any of you are interested in becoming a professor, please, at some point in the future, please come talk to me. I love talking about that topic. So as some of you who may be law review editors know, one of the most important aspects of getting your paper accepted in the law review is having a good, flashy title. Uh, here are ones I'm currently ruminating over. They're not great. So if you have better thoughts, I will definitely take them. Common law baselines and current free speech doctrine, reconciling originalism and free speech doctrine, common law clarity and current free speech doctrine. I need another C word. That's just a one word C word that's a synonym for free speech doctrine. Nothing is coming up. Um, so definitely let me know. But uh, just to define our terms here, the common law is judgment law that we inherited from England that defines our rights and duties. Uh, tort law, property law, a lot of this all evolves from the common law. Um, and baselines are the thing, the parameters that are set from which we deviate. So if the common law sets the baseline for the First Amendment, then all of our uh, you know, property as distributed by the common law doesn't count as state action. And when the government intervenes to do something, it's on a sort of background um, presumption of common law rights and duties. But we'll get into this more as the talk proceeds. But that's where we are with common law baselines. So most First Amendment scholarship is focused on defining the freedom of speech. Uh, because the First Amendment prohibits Congress and now the states and the executive and basically any government official from abridging the freedom of speech. First Amendment scholarship generally, and my scholarship specifically, has in the past mostly been doctrinal and what I would call internally theoretical. So there are tons of theories about free speech law, but the theories are about what um, motivates First Amendment doctrine. So should it be the marketplace of ideas? Should it be autonomy? Things like that. Um, it's sort of just policy rationales internal to free speech. Um, the big sort of hot topics in First Amendment law right now are whether the First Amendment uh, free speech doctrine is egalitarian or libertarian meaning should um, courts be focused on equalizing free speech rights among citizens, non-citizens, um, or you know, protecting minority voices, or should the courts mostly be worried about any intervention of the government into the marketplace of ideas? Is any sort of governmental intervention, even if it's intended to equalize access, skewing marketplace of ideas? Another big aspect of uh, First Amendment doctrine right now is harms balancing. And I write a lot about harms balancing. So what do we do when speech causes harm? When do we let the states protect people against that harm? When does the First Amendment intervene? Uh, and this is sort of the speech torts area. Defamation, harassment, privacy rights, things like that. Um, 
This is my former scholarship. As you can see, it does involve a lot of harms balancing and libertarian versus egalitarian thinking. Emotional duties, I argue that tort law should maintain a distinction between physical harm and emotional harm, um, in part to protect our ability to speak that we should have a duty to reasonably regulate our own emotional well-being, in part to preserve autonomy for other people's expression. Free speech consequentialism is about which harms will override free speech protections and which will not. Competing free speech values in a major protest is about um, when what I call free speech values uh, come into conflict with free speech doctrine. So when is it that the state's non-intervention actually jeopardizes free speech values because the state's intervention would promote free speech values? Um, and First Amendment Cynicism and Redemption, this is my latest paper, I talk about um, First Amendment Cynicism, which I define as using the First Amendment disingenuously to further political ends that are unrelated to free speech. So the left has accused the right of Lochnerizing the First Amendment, or turning it into a general deregulatory tool, and the right has accused the left of abandoning the First Amendment in pursuit of goals such as equality. And the point of this paper is to sort of alleviate everyone's fears about First Amendment cynicism so we can all make nice and continue to respect the First Amendment. In writing these papers, I have bumped up against the notion that I have presumed common law baselines. Um, so when I say that you know, in free speech consequentialism that we can regulate harms that are closer to conduct harms than speech harms, so we can't regulate things that cause the kind of harms that speech would cause, but we can regulate things that cause the kind of harms uh, that conduct causes, I have internalized assumptions about common law baselines, things like Fraud, defamation, assault, breach of contract, these are all conduct harms because they're discreet, uh, they're generally not diffused, they're generally not moderated through our emotional processes, but instead sort of concrete facts about the outside world. Whereas privacy harms and emotional harms cannot be um, restricted in the same way. The First Amendment is going to serve as a huge trump in these areas. Um, and those, again, are sort of set against a common law baseline that has defined our property rights and contract rights, and anything that goes above and beyond that, like regulating our emotional tranquility, is going to present a First Amendment problem. Realists, legal realists, believe there are no such things as natural common law baselines, that they're not actually pre-political, that when the government defines our property rights, that this is an affirmative step by the government that affects the distribution of entitlements and again like affects our ability to speak. So the more property you have, the greater your ability to speak. If you own the New York Times, you have a much larger platform than if you just have a little blog. Um, and ownership of the New York Times is set by property law. I would consider that outside of the First Amendment regime, but that's because I'm considering property law to be part of a common law baseline, um, even though you know, that has to be justified. Uh, that many people, especially today, sort of prevalent to say, there aren't such things as common law baselines. This is all should have fallen out of favor with Lochner. Let me just say, by the way, I'm going to take questions at the end, but if you have a burning question in the middle that cannot be extinguished, please just ask it. Uh, I remember what it was like to sit through lectures and like hold on to my question the entire time, and it was maddening. So just <laughs> ask it if you want to. Uh, so, you know, I have never really been thinking about philosophies of constitutional interpretation. I've been thinking a lot about uh, philosophies of free speech, theories of free speech. I had not been thinking a lot about sort of grander theories of how to interpret the Constitution on the whole. Um, but, you know, in grappling with this idea of common law baselines, I thought, well, can we justify importing common law baselines into the First Amendment? Uh, what sort of constitutional interpretive theory would justify that? And as you likely know, there are sort of a spectrum of possible theories of constitutional interpretation. Um, people categorize these as originalist and non-originalist. Um, the originalist ones say that the text was fixed at the time of drafting, either uh, eradication, either the constitutional text, 
or the amendments, original public meaning uh, says that it's what the people at the time of ratification thought the words would mean. Original intent says it's what the drafters or the ratifiers thought the provisions would mean. And uh, the sort of new one is original methods, which says we should use the methodology of the people who drafted the amendment. So if the drafters of the Eighth Amendment prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment thought that that should evolve over time, our interpretation of it should evolve over time, then originalism, originalism says we should interpret the Eighth Amendment to evolve over time. This is original methods, originalism. In terms of non-originalism, you know, on one end of the spectrum, we have living constitutionalism, which says the drafters uh, or the views of the people at the time are largely irrelevant, that we should, the Constitution should be elastic, it should grow with uh, changes in uh, social mores or views about, you know, how best to run a just society. I think most people, and I would have put myself into this category, are sort of mixed that the meaning of the text matters. It matters to a great degree. It matters to varying degrees to different people. But that there are other things that matter as well, such as precedent and policy, um, you know, things like that. So, you know, I, I never had to commit to a particular interpretive philosophy because I did First Amendment work, where I could just dabble in the theories underlying the First Amendment and the coherence of the doctrine. Um, but this paper that I'm writing here has forced me to uh, think more deeply about what interpretive philosophy I actually want to apply to my own work. Um, and so I wanted to do an originalist project and think about whether or not I could incorporate the common law baselines as they existed at the time of the ratification of the First Amendment into our current understanding of the meaning of the freedom of speech. So could I create a system of why and how the common law should be incorporated? Uh, and that would require me to know what was the common law at the time of the framing, and potentially then again at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which incorporated the First Amendment. And also, what does this say about how we should understand free speech doctrine? This sort of project caused me some concerns. The reason it caused me concerns is because I'm very committed to fairly robust, protective First Amendment rights. And what if I found that the common law is actually quite unprotective of free speech rights? Would that require me to change all my substantive commitments about the First Amendment? And what would I do then? Would I just have to retract everything I said? Would I have to just become a different person? Uh, it was unclear. You know, this is the sort of essence of academic work, is you're supposed to embark on a journey not knowing where it's going to lead you. But in truth, most of the time, people have their normative biases that they take with them when they start on an academic project, and they don't really want <coughs> to abandon them. And I have to admit that I am no different, but I did want to approach this project in earnest. So um, my role, I'm not a historian, I'm a legal academic. So what I wanted to do was pour through history as it's been exposed by a number of historians and also go to the primary sources, but figure out a way to use that history to better understand the doctrine, um, to lend greater coherence to the doctrine. So what my role, I see it in, in writing this paper about incorporating common law based on into the First Amendment, is to merge history with the doctrine. This has been extremely fun for me. Um, I have basically been able to pour over a ton of texts about people's views at the founding of our nation uh, in a way that I never have had the opportunity to do so before. This, uh, which is just, this is the floor of your library. This is um, Madison's notes to himself as he's proposing the constitutional amendments to Congress. And they read, they're, they're transcribed in this book, but they read as sort of like any notes that I would just write to myself about preparing a lecture. It's crazy how mundane they look, but this is, his, this is the first part of his notes. Reasons for urging amendments. One, to prove Federalists friends to liberty. Like, 
it's just overwhelming to me, um, like how grandiose this entire project was, and yet how mundane it was in another sense when they were just sort of trying to push this through Congress. Uh, so if you are ever interested in just being totally blown away by what was going on uh, during the adoption of the Constitution, it's all in your library, and it's totally wonderful. So, um, as I'm proceeding through this paper, a number of roadblocks and surprises uh, arise. For example, no one knows what the freedom of speech means. There is just no agreement about what uh, either the common people at the time or the drafters of the Constitution intended to mean by the freedom of speech. The evidence is ambiguous. Different people have different views. But more than that, no one actually articulated their views. Um, it's just really ill-defined. This is largely because the debates about the constitutional amendments mostly centered around whether or not we should have amendments at all. Uh, and that is because the Federalists didn't want amendments because they thought having amendments would undermine the idea that the Constitution limits the power of the federal government. Um, and so the big debate between the Federalists and the Republicans was about whether or not to have amendments at all. And then once the Constitution was ratified and Madison was proposing these amendments, he was so worried about there being arguments <coughs> over the amendments that would ultimately kill his project, the Constitution, that he was just trying to get consensus on accepting these amendments sort of wholesale. And there's basically no debate about what the freedom of speech means. So uh, the evidence in terms of originalist thinking, in terms of just looking at sort of the debates in Congress or the state ratifying uh, conventions, is very scarce, and most people who have studied these issues have just thrown up their hands and said, we don't know what it means. Uh, but I want to argue in my paper that there are reasons, based on the structure of the Constitution, plus the natural rights background that existed at the time of the adoption of the First Amendment, that can get us to where we are, that can help explain and justify the current doctrine that we have today. Which is great because it's um, very different than the current academic thinking. And if you want to write a successful law review article, you basically have to say that everyone who came before you was wrong about something, and this is your contribution. So what I'm saying is that uh, contrary to the view that the First Amendment has deviated very far from the, its original meaning, I actually think most of the doctrine can be justified and explained by understanding the freedom of speech as it incorporates both uh, common law understandings that existed at the time of the framing and this natural rights background. The current paradigm is dominated by this dispute between Zachariah Chafee and Leonard Levy. So Zachariah Chafee, writing in the early 40s, articulated a pretty libertarian conception of what the freedom of speech meant at the time of its adoption. He said um, it was supposed to end the seditious libel prosecutions that were happening both in England and in the colonies. It was supposed to allow for a wide swath of speech that could not be restricted before the fact and could not be punished after the fact. And Chafee is largely responsible for a lot of the jurisprudence becoming much more speech protective in the early 1900s than it had been before. <laughs> then, Leonard Levy comes along uh, in 1960 and writes this book called Legacy of Suppression, and he says, actually, that's not true at all. Um, there was this huge legacy of speech suppression uh, at the time that the First Amendment was drafted, both in England and in the colonies, and basically nobody cared about freedom of speech except if they were speaking. But they were very happy to suppress the speech of anyone who disagreed with them. And all the freedom of speech actually means is freedom against prior restraint. So you can't license people's printing presses or take away their printing presses. Uh, but after the fact, if they abuse the privilege of the freedom of speech, you can certainly punish them. 
So seditious libel punishments were okay. You just cannot lay prior restraints upon speech. My view is that actually the current doctrine is basically a compromise position between these two sort of polar uh, disputes. So my thesis so far for the paper I'm writing is that the Constitution provides reasons to read common law baselines into the First Amendment, that our current doctrine reflects the common law that existed at the time of the framing, uh, and that thinking of the First Amendment in this way can lend clarity and theoretical coherence to the doctrine. So, where do I get my reasons for incorporating common law baselines into the Constitution, and then what are those common law baselines? So if you look at the structure of the Constitution, it gives us a lot of clues that the common law baselines that existed at the time of the framing were supposed to be read into our interpretation of the Constitution. You look at the Ninth Amendment, um, the enumeration in the Constitution of Certain Rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. This supports my thesis in a couple of ways. I think the primary way is by analogy. What the Ninth Amendment shows is that the framers were thinking about unenumerated rights and not wanting them to be lost by the sheer fact that we are enumerating other rights. These unenumerated rights potentially being the common law rights and duties that existed that formed part of the consciousness of everyone at the time that the First Amendment was being enacted. There's another sense uh, where one scholar argues that actually the Ninth Amendment provides its own rights, like rights against defamation, so right to reputation, right to privacy, that the First Amendment shouldn't counteract. So all of those rights should actually trump our free speech rights, um, and they can be imported in through the Ninth Amendment. I actually don't agree with that necessarily, because most of the rights are negative rights in the Bill of Rights, and so they're not rights the government gives us, like protection of our personality, protection of our reputation. But I think that by analogy, there are good reasons to incorporate common law baselines into our understanding of the First Amendment. Um, and the common law was just something that was on everyone's mind at the time that the constitutional amendments were ratified. So people really just presumed that um, we would be kind of in, um, interpreting the law the way that sort of judges have been for centuries. So what is the common law at the time of the uh, framing of the First Amendment? So I'm going to argue that Blackstone's commentaries of, on the law of England will set the common law baselines. Because many historians have shown that it's just how the people understood the common law. That he was the first person to really articulate kind of a coherent, uh, comprehensive vision of what the common law was, what our property rights were, um, what our bodily autonomy rights were, and that this is how people understood the common law. They were widely circulated in England. They were highly popular in America. They were read by almost everyone who was involved with the Constitution. So Blackstone is a good sort of starting point for understanding what our common law baselines are. Um, now Blackstone said that freedom of speech is only freedom of speech against prior restraint, and that's obviously not the system that we have today. But he also said that truth is a defense to civil libel. And that basically is the system that we have today. Um, you know, whether you put the burden of proof on the defendant or put the burden of proof on the plaintiff, that can come out as a construction issue, giving sort of legal force to the interpretation of the text. But it basically matches sort of our thinking in terms of how harms uh, match up against rights, which is that there's a lot of room for protecting people against defamation, just as there was back then. Now, Blackstone does say criminal libel, um, truth is not a defense to criminal libel. And the reason truth was not a defense to criminal libel is because uh, back then what they thought was the greater the truth, the greater the libel. Meaning, the more true something is, the more it's going to have an impact on your reputation, which is, is likely right. 
But what Blackstone was worried about was breaches of the peace. And I think that our current doctrine accounts for this using the incitement standard. The incitement standard says that speech that is reasonably directed towards and reasonably likely to cause imminent lawless action is unprotected. So if Blackstone was just worried about breaches of the peace, and that's why criminal libel doesn't have truth as a defense, then the courts have worked that into their jurisprudence to some degree. Now, not only was the common law in everyone's consciousness, but a natural rights background also sort of permeated the zeitgeist of the time. And what natural rights say is that we have certain rights uh, prior to forming political systems. Um, you have to give up some of those rights in order to exist in a civilized society, but some of them are inalienable. The government cannot take them away. Uh, and many people believe that one of those was the right to express yourself on matters that are true as long as you have good motives. Um, and this goes a long way to explaining our very categorical speech protective approach. Um, regulation of other expression was allowed as long as it was in the public good. So you couldn't uh, regulate expression to benefit one group over another group, but general uh, regulation of expression was okay as long as it was um, for the general public good. So I think this goes pretty far, and these are just a few examples, but this goes pretty far to explain the current doctrine. I mentioned a libel example. Um, the way that we think about harms as they interact with the First Amendment on a sort of spectrum from conduct harms can be totally regulated, emotional harms uh, are really going to run up against First Amendment problems, defamation is somewhere in the middle, privacy is somewhere in the middle. This completely maps onto the common law that existed uh, at the time of the founding. So for example, intentional infliction of emotional distress, very new invention. Uh, protection of emotions in this way was not understood at the time of the ratification of the First Amendment, was not understood to uh, be important at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment. And if you look at cases like Snyder versus Phelps, the court has very little patience for emotional injury as it intersects with First Amendment rights. First Amendment rights are generally going to trump. Privacy rights, which uh, were sort of invented with um, Brandeis, uh, you know, also didn't really exist at the time. And we have very little protection for privacy rights now as they intersect with First Amendment rights. And this is in contrast to many other countries. European countries have much greater scope of protection for privacy rights. Um, but we say, for example, you cannot prevent newspapers from publishing the names of victims of crimes. Most newspapers will often protect people's privacy anyway and not publish those names, but you cannot prohibit the publishing of those names. Because the First Amendment generally trumps privacy rights. Privacy rights, not part of our conception of our general rights and duties at the founding. Except for one area, which is <coughs> publicity. So if you are a college football player, and a video game takes your likeness and puts it into its game, and you sue, most courts are not going to say, well, the First Amendment uh, trumps your lawsuit here, and so they're allowed to just throw your likeness into their video game. Most courts are going to give you what's called a right of publicity, because the video game has appropriated your name and likeness for its own commercial purposes. And the reason the First Amendment doesn't trump in this case <coughs> is because this much more closely resembles a property right that did, did exist at the time of the ratification of the First Amendment. So even in these tiny little pockets, like protection of personality, where right of uh, publicity is recognized and right of privacy is generally trumped by the First Amendment, um, we see this common law understanding permeating through the doctrine. So great. I feel like I can explain many aspects of our First Amendment system based on presumptions of common law. I feel like I can justify importing common law under space lines into our understanding of the First Amendment. So now we look to the future and we say, well, how can this lend coherence and clarity to the doctrine? Well, one aspect of the common law is that it's reciprocal. 
I have my property rights, except to the extent that they interfere with your property rights. I have my bodily autonomy, except to the extent it interferes with your bodily autonomy. Things that are reciprocal in this way set nice, easy, what I would consider to be neutral baselines. Things like emotional tranquility, those sorts of rights, they can't really be reciprocal in the same way. Um, if I interfere with your emotional tranquility and you sue me for that, that's also going to make me unhappy. So now I'm unhappy and you are unhappy and this can't really be enforced in a way that gives anyone a large sphere of emotional rights without infringing on a lot of freedom. Right? Property rights have clearly defined reciprocal boundaries. You can't really do this with dignitary rights. And so, it's both constitutionally justified and coherent to say that these sort of newer torts are going to be superseded by the First Amendment in a way that the older torts uh, are not. And this can help organize different types of harms in future cases as cases get more and more complicated. So things I want to think about. Does the 14th Amendment change this? Um, at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment, the common law had evolved from where it was at the time of the ratification of the First Amendment. Uh, there are books written about the debates around anti-slavery debates, things like that. Um, my general intuition is, no, the 14th Amendment is not going to change anything. Um, does it change the categorical approach we have to the First Amendment? Because natural rights are very balancing heavy. Our current scheme of you know, large protections for free speech rights is based on a categorical approach where we define categories of protected and unprotected speech. Uh, does that have to change if we have a common law understanding of the First Amendment with an unnatural uh, rights overlay? I would generally say no, uh, but I, I need to do some more thinking about this because the categorical approach could just be a way of constructing, giving legal force to the First Amendment uh, as opposed to an actual interpretation, but the categorical approach could still be consistent with uh, common law baseline. Pornography is a tough issue. Obscenity was pretty... Um, easily restricted at the time of the founding, but it also existed in kind of copious amounts at the time of the founding. Public accommodations laws. So this is like the big issue that uh, came up in Masterpiece Cake Shop. Um, you know, what about public accommodations laws that intersect with what many consider to be speech? So cakes, photographs, things like that. If people refuse to <coughs> Um, big cakes or take photographs of certain events, uh, and those are considered sort of discriminatory based on public accommodations laws. What do we do about that? What does the common law have to say about that? My general view is uh, to the extent that um, the public accommodations laws are worried about stigma, stigma is kind of an emotional dignitary harm that they can't take into account. To the extent that the public accommodations laws are worried about people actually being able to um, participate in a market of commerce, then that is something that uh, the public accommodations laws can account for. What do I do about the heckler's veto? The heckler's veto is a positive right. It basically says if you're speaking and people want to sort of assault you because they're very angry at what you're saying, the government has an affirmative duty to protect you. How does that fit into the common law scheme? Well, the common law does give a bunch of positive rights. And one of them is a right against assault. So, I mean, even there, we can see the common law kind of explaining the doctrine. So now that I've been through all this, you know, I, I have to ask myself, who am I? Uh, what am I doing? Where is my scholarship going? You know, large existential questions you want to ask yourself all the time, right? Um, and I'm... I'm moving toward really appreciating, um, even though most people say the First Amendment has nothing to do with originalism, the new originalism uh, that's coming out of this uh, law school, actually, um, especially with its distinction between interpretation and construction, uh, that does leave a lot of room for debate about how the First Amendment should be constructed. Um, and I'm looking forward to having those sorts of debates and figuring out how we ground those debates, right? How do we give, once we know how to interpret something, how do we give it legal force? Do we categorize? Do we balance? What do we do? Um, 
And the final thing I want to ask myself is, to whom is this paper speaking? So are my views only going to be persuasive to originalists? Or uh, can I have this paper appeal even to non-originalists? And that's where I sort of say, this originalist type thinking just has wisdom that has been picked up over the course of the jurisprudence without anyone really systematizing it. But we really should be looking to the common law for that sort of wisdom because it's developed for such a long time. Okay, that's where I am now. So uh, I think we have like 10 minutes left or something like that. If anyone has questions about any topic, I'm happy. Yes. I'd love to pick up on your last point about how this is sort of developed in the case law. How, when the courts have come up with these, at least recognize these exceptions, like everyone knows the fire and crowded theater or um, the uh, uh, incitement to violence exceptions, have they either directly cited this idea of a common law baseline or have they looked at founding or English documents and said, like, well, this is what they must have believed or did it just come uh, prudentially? Yeah, so the interesting thing is that the courts will often cite to the common law that existed at the time, and not just in the First Amendment context. In the Fourth Amendment context, they'll cite to you know, the common law involving general warrants or things like that. They'll sort of <coughs> sprinkle common law discussions into opinions about constitutional issues, um, but there hasn't been a systematic justification for doing so. And this is because I think everyone is generally a mixed originalist, non-originalist, where they say, well, it mattered a little bit, but other things matter too, and we'll just like throw everything at the wall, right? Um, I mean, nowadays, uh, the prevailing wisdom is that the First Amendment has deviated so far from the common law that raising the common law would only be to restrict First Amendment rights. And my project is to try to use the common law to expand First Amendment rights and clarify them. So that's a great question. Um, but generally speaking, uh, in First Amendment opinions, there is not a lot of reference to the common law. Yes? I'm a 1L, so I apologize, but this is just the most basic question. It's not. I already know, know it's not. Go on. You started talking about new originalism that's coming out of this law school also, and the difference between interpretation and construction. I, I have no idea what that is. Oh, good. OK. Uh, yeah, OK. So I, um, I was worried that was going to be too obvious to you guys. So, uh, but because I didn't know what you guys know about what people are doing here. Also, this is being recorded. So now, <laughs> now I'm going to speak on behalf of other people, and hopefully I will do them justice. But uh, new originalism has um, the, the idea that uh, the Constitution was fixed at the time that it was ratified, and that constrains interpreters, meaning uh, you cannot interpret the Constitution in a way that deviates from that fixed meaning. But there's a difference between interpretation, where you decide what the Constitution means, and construction, where you give it legal force. So for example, um, a judge could have a broad categorical rule, like say, in a defamation case, if you're a public figure suing for defamation, you have to prove actual malice. Whether or not that's part of the meaning of the First Amendment, that's what the court is using to implement the First Amendment, to say, look, you know, we're worried about any legal rule we create having incentives on society, and so we're going to create an administrable rule that cuts down on frivolous litigation. So the construction is the part where you put the legal meaning into force, into sort of legal effect. Um, and that is not entirely dictated by the interpretation of the provision. Does this make sense to you? So now, I mean, the, the, what they would call the construction zone, and this is not any work that I've done, but it's several professors here are doing work on this. You know, there's plenty of room for debate about how best to give legal force to a particular meaning. Does that help you? Yes. I'm glad you asked that. Other questions? Yeah. Um, do you mind just expounding a little bit on um, how you would propose dealing with these dig these dignitary rights, like burden on stig emotional burden, stigma, all of that? Yes. Right. Okay. So my view uh, generally um, is that they would not 
be regulable uh, because they uh, are trumped by First Amendment rights. That said, um, you know, expression sort of at the time, at the, at the founding, could be regulated if it had bad motives or if it was in the public good to regulate it. So there is a difference between something that causes emotional harm and is on a topic of public concern and potentially something that causes emotional harm and is on a purely private matter that might be likely to cause some sort of breach of the peace. And that could justify a real distinction between allowing IIED uh, towards to proceed in cases of purely private, kind of outrageous behavior, speech towards people versus like the Snyder versus Phelps example. Um, I'm generally in favor of the system we have now where speech rights trump privacy rights. But I could see, to the extent that privacy rights implicate some sort of property interest or reputational interest, that can be taken care of there. Other final questions? Yes? Yeah, so within the category of, of stuff that the First Amendment does cover, does originalism and consideration of common law baselines have anything to say about the level of scrutiny that should apply to a particular thing? Yeah, so level of scrutiny is a purely judicial construction, right? And it um, obviously applies to all of our constitutional uh, rights, or most of our constitutional rights are considered using this scrutiny paradigm. Um, I mean, you know, to the extent that something is well-meaning expression of opinion, it does seem to counsel in favor of strict scrutiny. Right? Now, a system where we had tiers of scrutiny, like commercial speech, political speech, political speech gets strict scrutiny, commercial speech gets intermediate scrutiny, that's not justified by the common law, right? I mean, that is definitely something that, um, you know, courts have created. And that is something, actually, I should really think about, whether um, that aspect of our jurisprudence even makes sense. Right? Um, but for the most part, the First Amendment is, is binary. It's kind of an on off switch, right? Strict scrutiny, if it's protected expression, uh, sort of no scrutiny. If it's not protected expression, if it falls within an exception. And I do think the common law regime supports that. But to the extent we have this middle tier, intermediate scrutiny, I don't think the common law would, would be in harmony with that sort of thing. Um, well, if there are no other questions, if you have questions about being a professor or like existential questions about your life, <laughs> that's totally fine too. You can come up to me after, but thank you for coming.